Okay, welcome to the DNVGL Transition Faster Conference. I am your moderator, Ellen Cravella, and I serve as the head of department for project development and engineering here in North America at DNVGL. Today, we have two fantastic industry experts who will share insights about offshore permitting and development activities. Both are pioneers in our industry, and I could not be more pleased to introduce you to Rachel Pachter and Laura Morton. Rachel is the Chief Development Officer at Vineyard Wind and has been leading permitting and development efforts in the offshore wind space for nearly 20 years. Starting with her groundbreaking contributions to the Cape Wind Project and continuing with her work at Vineyard, she's been a long-standing pillar of ideas and actions to facilitate getting steel in the water in the U.S. Laura Morton is the Senior Director for Policy and Regulatory Affairs for Offshore Wind at the American Clean Power Association. Trained as an attorney with a background shaped by work at both NOAA and the Department of Energy, Laura is responsible for facilitating the offshore wind industry's efforts to transition faster to a grid backed by many gigawatts of offshore wind energy. So as we get started, please feel free for those of you in the audience to start sending us your questions throughout the session. We will answer those at the end. And Laura and Rachel, let's jump right into it. So as we okay. enter 2021, can you give us an update of your view on the overall offshore wind landscape in the US? Laura, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, well, I think we start with it's a very exciting time in the U.S. Um, we have been a bit behind on our permitting and regulatory process uh, for a while. And we only have, as folks know, probably 42 megawatts um, installed in the U.S. versus up to the 29 gigawatts in uh, global um, landscape. But we do feel like we're making some progress. We have had a comprehensive review of the project that uh, Rachel may talk about. Um, heading towards the uh, end point for that, we have another project that's out for environmental review right now. And we do have a new administration coming in um, that we feel pretty good about. And uh, you know, we also have these state ambitious targets, states being a critical part of this, um, more than 29,000 mega, 29, megawatts um, anticipated uh, and targets coming up. Um, even just today, there was an award in New York of the largest offshore wind um, contract in the U.S. Great. And Rachel, over to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about the status of your project and talk more broadly about the landscape in the U.S., if you like? Yeah, no, thank you, Ellen. It's great to be here um, with this audience and and thanks for having us. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would echo everything Laura said. It's obviously an exciting time. We're seeing, uh, uh, you know, a big push towards addressing climate change and offshore wind is a key part of that solution. Um, Vineyard Wind is the sort of first project in this current pipeline of commercial scale projects. So that's the project, uh, one of several projects that uh, I lead with our team and we are um, uh nearing the finish line uh we actually are just doing a final review we've selected a wind turbine and doing a final review to make sure that our permits will be completely aligned with um, the projects one of the challenges we see here in the us is that our permitting uh system takes a while a few years you know three years or so and uh in the meantime obviously offshore wind develops so quickly so we do have to kind of, you know, make sure we're evolving our project descriptions to make sure that the permits we get work with the project. We're doing that final check for the Vineyard Win One project. Um, and that's an 800 megawatt project that was awarded a PPA by the state of Massachusetts in uh, 2018. And we should be very good to go after that. We'd be completing a, uh, a long rigorous process. So this is just the first in a long pipeline as Laura talked about um, of projects and, and we're super excited to, to as you know, as Ellen said, get that steel in the water. Great. And so you touched on this a little bit, Rachel, but we all know on this uh, session here that in the U.S. there are many different federal, state, local, and even regional requirements in some instances for offshore wind projects. 
Is there a simple way, keeping in mind that we may have a global audience with us here today, is there a way to, that you think in terms of comparing the U.S. to other global markets from a permitting and regulatory perspective? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I think you probably, you know, even a global audience will know that the U.S. for, uh, since its inception, I guess, is always sort of, uh, talked about the relative jurisdictions of states and the federal government and for offshore wind projects we have to address both um, as well as local governments in order to get projects done so the projects themselves are actually in, in a, what what are determined to be federal waters in the u.s which is more than three miles offshore um, however when we bring the power to shore we do and, and in the u.s you know sort of maybe different than some other countries uh, at least the initial projects are providing the transmission um so we are also responsible for the grid connection and so we are going through those state waters local waters local towns um to get the projects done so it is it is complicated um it is very complicated uh, and it does require a number of different agencies and even at the federal level and at the state level and the local level there are sometimes multiple agencies um the good news is folks like this have been working together for a long time and so I think it's really been an effort to adapt that to the specifics of offshore wind. And I think that's what's new to folks, not the permitting regimes itself um, in some cases and in others, some of that's a little bit new. Yeah, Laura, maybe uh, over to you on this topic. Are there perhaps um, things that you're hearing from the membership of ACP uh, since many of them are global developers that have some experience in the market in Europe. Uh, and Rachel, you can jump in on this too, because I know that you have some JV uh, relationships too with some players that uh, have historically played in the European market. So just curious to know if what you're hearing, are there any lessons uh, that you're learning from the European colleagues that you're interacting with, or, or maybe it's going the other way and you're teaching them a thing or two? I'd be curious, both of you, uh, for your thoughts on that. Well, so I'm happy to um, to step in a bit. I was about to step in before, and uh, where I was just wanted to build um, a little bit on what Rachel had said, which is the complexity um, of these projects, nascent industry, new waters, um, and you know any any industry in the United States does have to go through all of these complex federal and state permitting processes, uh, whether it's a port, a multi-state transmission line, other renewable energy facilities, oil and gas facilities, um, really, you know, wherever you have it, they're huge infrastructure projects. Um, and offshore wind is new. And so I think that that's something that I hadn't really said initially. Um, you know, there just are going to be slowdowns and regulatory challenges. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out uh, that Rachel had also um, discussed a bit uh, we also are dealing with a huge number, and this is not any different globally, but you know, all of the other ocean users. Uh, we've got the maritime community, we've got the shipper, you know, the sh shipping tugboats, uh, you know, got the Coast Guard out there, we have got coastal communities, um, other local groups, tribes, uh, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, um, you name it. And so just like any other um, project worldwide, you know, we have these in critical um, ocean users that we are working really closely with. Um, and I think Rachel can probably speak a bit more um, to the global, uh, you know, the, the view of a global company versus um, what we're looking at in the US. Um, I do think that everything that I'm saying here um, somewhat does come um, as a surprise for um, sort of the early entrance to the market, although everybody is figuring it out quickly and understands somewhat of the alphabet soup of the US. but you know, it's a long process, uh, but we do have the front movers like uh, Rachel's project and with her experience that, you know, we're going to learn a lot from. So I'd actually, Ellen, I could turn it over to Rachel to build on, I think, what I was saying, maybe. Yeah, so so it's a great question, and, and it's, been a, it's, it's been a big adventure. When we did the Cape Wind project, it really was, um, you know, a small company and we were sort of the first one out there without a regulatory regime. So that was, you know, that was an interesting experience. But now, you know, we've got a lot more of a global market and um, the Vineyard Wind team is a joint venture between Avant Grid Renewables um, related to the Iberdrola Group as, you know, has the Scottish Power name with them and all of their experience. 
we also have um, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners as well, um, partnered with Copenhagen Offshore Partners, um, which is act actually technically who I work for. Um, and so, you know, this experience uh, spans, you know, almost all of the offshore projects throughout the world. And I think um, the key part here too is that Vineyard Wind actually was the first project uh, to bid into an auction with uh, the federal government in Massachusetts with a community uh, benefit agreement and an agreement with the local community to uh, work closely on what specific types of benefits projects could bring locally. And I think that was actually interestingly born out of a desire for folks to really own projects and be a part of projects. And obviously offshore wind projects are, um, they're big investments and they're kind of challenging to do uh, with a local community uh, having a small load demand and very different economics. Um, but there are lots of other things we can do, like where do we put an O&M facility um, and things like that. And you're seeing obviously the pressure in the US like you do in other markets um, for local content development. So I would say that, you know, Vineyard Wind in particular, we benefit from the sort of, you know, that global experience. Um, however, that that big focus on local piece. Um, and I will say at the development stage of projects, it is very country unique. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it is interesting. You run into the same issues across countries and the solutions that address them, I do find are different, but I think it's also evolving. Um, so I think, you know, there are different stages that benefit more from, you know, a bidding stage, maybe early on, people have a lot more market experience. And so our bids and our prices are probably getting tighter with the global experience. I'd say the development is still very local and obviously construction benefits tremendously from, from all that global experience. Mm -hmm. It brings up a good point. It makes me think about supply chain as well. You know, some of the supply chain, we're building a lot of local presence, a lot of local jobs. Um, but then we're also seeing some need for vessels and for understanding and for construction approaches or installation approaches that maybe have been tested in other places globally. I'm just curious to hear any of your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, and Ellen, if I could jump in, I think I could start and then uh, Rachel can, of course, uh, based on many conversations, share her point of view. Um, we absolutely see a lot of opportunity for um, legacy oil and gas workers um, from the Gulf to diversify their experience, um, use their maritime expertise, uh, bring it up the coast, um, help install these projects. There's so many opportunities. Um, you know, it, overall, um, the projection is that offshore wind could bring almost 83,000 jobs um, to the US, and that's just right now. And I think that's a huge number. That is not just local content, but those are folks again, with the legacy expertise. Um, and so, you know, again, I mentioned we have the mariners, we have the shipbuilders um, and just the general, you know, the, the actual uh, installers, um, the vessels themselves that are being built in the Gulf. There's a US flagged vessel that's being built right now. Um, so that kind of a supply chain is something that we're looking for to drive the market. Um, and we really need to have that to bring the investment in the US. Um, so I think that's a sort of a starting point on the Gulf Coast, at least legacy worker point of view. Yeah, and I think also, you know, with the with the sort of job workforce, I think one thing we don't even talk about is how broadly these, you know, the jobs are, the, the projects are huge. So, you know, the development of, redevelopment of ports and what that means for communities that might've been, you know, previous, uh, might've had previous industries that are not as big anymore. Um, or, you know, might be less or so if it's the fishing industry and, and the port's been, you know, is, is been underutilized. Um, there's huge opportunity just for those communities as a whole, um, sort of a rising tide lifts all boats, um, cliche, if you will, uh, that will, you know, that's a big part of it. The scientists that we engage, um, you know, the growth and sort of even the agencies and the government needs to expand in order to review all of the projects. So. I think you know we've got we've got a lot of people that I think people don't even think about who are working in offshore wind now, um, and those grow those needs are growing exponentially. Um, and so I think that's that's also part of it that that expertise and people can look forward to that when they go to school and and that's a career they can get into, uh, similar to what you could do with oil and gas, and you can now do that I think with offshore wind in the U.S. Uh huh. Um, that's really exciting. Ellen, I could also. I could also just sort of step in here too, which is that Rachel mentioned, you know, local 
local content, local workforce. I mean, the states up and down the coast have invested in, you know, they've got their maritime academies. They also have a lot of workforce development training programs underway to bring people into the sector. Um, and then the other piece about the, you know, those communities who may have had uh, prior industries there, we have opportunities here for um, something very important to us today, which is environmental justice and helping out uh, building and bringing jobs into local communities that have been otherwise disadvantaged. Um, so not only is that job content, but that also goes to our clean energy mission and reducing the effects of climate change. Um, and so that's something we really see as another great um, opportunity for the industry and a benefit for the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and maybe building on that theme of benefits and advantages, I know we talked a little bit about some of the challenges of being a first mover, but I'm curious for your reflections on if there are any benefits to being in that position as a first mover. I take it that's for me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no, there are a lot of benefits. I mean, you know, myself and several other members of my team um, came in from having worked through a lot of challenges to get the Cape Wind project fully permitted, which we ultimately did, even though it never um, ended up getting financed and, and didn't get built. Um, but we learned a lot from that, and we really know a lot about the ins and outs of, of this. And I think there's um, there's a lot of pieces of what we have done to get projects built that are not as visible to the outside world. Um, and I think one thing that we've done every step of the way is we've tried to put things forward before folks, before they sort of become official, even with regulators, you know, here's what we're going to include in a document and here's how it's going to come together. And it's been, you know, it's been a lot of really thinking through challenges. So um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the team that we've built. And so I think we've been in a good position to kind of work through a lot of those challenges, obviously, um, you know, it'd be nice to be doing it a little bit more side by side with some of the other developers. Um, you know, it is breaking the snow, you know, you feel like you're out there with your snowshoes and you'd like to let somebody else go first on this challenge or that challenge, um, uh, once in a while, but, uh, you know, I do think we've, uh, We've gotten to know the folks a lot really well and we've, you know, we've really kind of built those, but, you know, the lessons learned are, I think, primarily that it's very challenging. Um, and I think that there's a lot of pieces that have to come together. And I think in the end, what it's really going to need is, you know, more cohesion amongst the all of the developers for the entire industry to really get to where it needs to go, because I think part of it is that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of competition um we've had a kind of a which is not a problem in the sense that we have a steady sort of a steady flow of power purchase agreement awards and rfps which i think we just talked about the award today um and that's exciting but it also creates a level of competition that really doesn't get a break here in the us and help build the industry itself and so i know that's you know that's laura's that's laura's job to do that and i think you know because it's it's been uh you know it's been sort of a nascent industry for a long time and we've had regular competition. It's a challenge that I think we would we would really need you know to get to where we want to go. That we should uh, that we that I hope we will address you know in further detail in 21 and beyond. Laura, what do you think? You must have some reflections on what Rachel just said. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, as Rachel said, you know, being the, the first mover, we've actually learned a lot. Um, very positive from what Vineyard's done from uh, early engagement with stakeholders um, and otherwise and you know having the agencies learn um, no doubt competition is robust as auctions um, are held and bids are held and then bids to actually um, acquire uh, the opportunity for a state procurement um, but i have found that you know our uh, member community at acp is working i find very closely together um, in a number of other ways uh, which, um, and we hadn't really discussed this up to this point, but you know, collaboration again on science, uh, wildlife partnerships, um, trying to address some challenges regionally that are you know, really tough here. They're not just localized, but we do have you know, uh, migratory species. I'm no biologist, but I can say that. Um, you know, so we have the migratory species, we have the mammals, we have other impacts that go up and down the coast that need to really be addressed on a regional basis. And so I've really seen um, great advances in just my short term um, at ACP, which has been about a year and a half, but 
you know, in my career of over 10 years, watching this community really come together and address um, issues that are challenges in the permitting process, right? So it's not just the broader environmental, but it's how do you feed that into federal state permitting? And again, of course, the environmental organizations with whom we work so closely. So very long answer to, I've seen great progress and I'm really excited about where we are in 21 and it's gonna become even more challenging. We've got a lot of projects pending in the pipeline. So it's gonna be a race. Yeah, I think it's, I think one thing I would even add to that is that, you know, it's maybe different than other developments in other countries. We do have a fair number of leases that are quite close to each other. We have a lot of adjacent leases here, which I think is unique um, to some of the other developments. And so I do think we're all sort of in the same neighborhood, um, which kind of, you know, to Laura's point is, you know, is, is something different as far as the kind of importance of, of everybody kind of aligning to solve the problems together, because we're going to be exact same challenges between each project. So it's, it's, you know, it's an opportunity for sure for the industry to, to work together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know there's also been a lot of collaboration in the regulatory space too, as we, as this industry grows and evolves and changes, I know developers, uh, facilitated in large part by ACP are working collaboratively on different regulations or to meet the needs of different stakeholders. I wonder, Laura, if you could talk a little bit more about that. You touched on it briefly with the scientific community, but I, I think our audience would love to hear more on what we're doing in this jurisdiction in terms of collaboration to get stronger, better regulations in place and, and uh, working with and meeting the needs of some of the other stakeholders out there. Sure, I mean, I think if we're talking, you know, broader regulatory policy, um, certainly what ACP does is we bring all of our members together um, to address particular policy challenges before um, Interior Department, which is our main permitting agency, um, before the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, very long name, but um, that manages uh, oceans and fisheries. Um, so we work with all of our members to try to come up with solutions and strategies to help potentially influence policy or guide the agencies. Um, and you know, otherwise, of course, we have uh, we work on the legislative side with federal um, federal government with uh, Congress. Um, to try to come up with also some solutions on that side. Um, so I think, you know, more broadly, working with all the stakeholders, again, trying to talk to the agencies, which we do, um, if not a daily basis, on a weekly basis with the multiple staff in those agencies to try to, you know, thread the needle, solve problems that they may have, um, and also bringing our developers in to work with the agencies as well collaboratively, right? So not just project by project, which they already do, but bringing them in as a larger membership to address some of the really big challenges um, that the agencies would need help with. So as our final question, I'm going to ask you both to take out your crystal ball and tell us about the future. So we know there's a lot of excitement about the new administration in the US. And so I'm curious to get your parting thoughts for our attendees about what they can expect to see in the U.S. offshore wind development space in 2021. I'm happy to start if you would like. Um, Sounds great, Laura. Should it be my crystal, crystal ball of what I'd like to see or what I think we're going to see? Um, well, you can give us what both. I, I think. I can give you both. Um, what we would like to see um, is not only for Rachel, for Vineyard to move through, uh, get launched, get that um, momentum going. Um, we have a number of other projects that are waiting in the queue um, to have their environmental review started. Um, a number of others that have already submitted uh, their construction plans. Um, that then need to be reviewed. And the other thing that's exciting, um, along with moving the pending projects forward, is trying to get additional lease sales underway. Um, we have been waiting for additional lease sales um, in, in New York um, and in California um, for a long time. New York has been almost um, two years since uh, their last um, task force, is what it's called, was convened. The lease sale is pending. I mean, sorry, the lease sale is ready to go. Um, we just need 
poem to actually take action on it. And we do think that's going to happen in the coming year. So that's exciting. Um, and then, as I mentioned, these pending projects, getting those out the door, I do think we're going to have some projects ready to go and construction starting, um, bringing new vessels into play. So I, I think it's going to be an exciting year. And the states, as I mentioned, are not slowing down. So we have other states that are going to be issuing procurements in the coming months or not even just month with Rhode Island um, and these other bids being awarded. So it's it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously for us, it's um, it's not quite a one track mind, but it's it takes up a lot of space in our <laughs> track is, is the uh, to start construction on the Vineyard Win One project. And I think, you know, not just obviously um, for us sort of selfishly, if you will, but also just for the industry, you know, so much of this will come from having a project to learn from. And I think, you know, we do have a number of challenging stakeholder conversations, and I think they will all be well served uh, through having a commercial scale project that we can all learn from. So I think there's a lot of there, but I, I think, you know, we're really going to be in the meat of it this year um, and in the coming years, I would say, you know, we're going to be really with our sleeves are going to be fully rolled up. We're going to be, you know, I always sort of joke that offshore wind is like the the plant in Little Shop of Horrors for folks who haven't seen it, but it's sort of insatiable, right? We're going to take a, we're going to, you know, bring in all the people, all the good people that we can, and we're going to, you know, we're going to utilize them in all the different ways. And I think there's just, you know, we're going to be, you know, putting money and effort into ports um, and, you know, as, as Laura talked about vessels. So I think we're really going to be kind of in the meat of it. And I think people should be seeing this movement sort of really on the ground. In addition to the sort of high level policy, we're going to really see that wave of people who are really touched by the benefits um, just really on the ground. And I think people have been people have been pushing for that and excited for that and had visions for it. And now I think people are really going to to see it come to fruition. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be awesome. Great. And, and I just think, because uh, Laura, you gave maybe... me, I said like, you gave Go me ahead, the Laura. opportunity. I'm not very good at talking over people, but I got a bit excited. Is that, you know, I hadn't really mentioned as much that the new administration has got a comprehensive climate change plan and goal, and offshore wind is a critical part of that. They are not going to meet their clean energy and climate targets absent offshore wind being deployed. And the great thing is. It's in their plans. They understand it. The people working right now um, to move into the next administration understand it. So that's where my excitement lies as well, is not only seeing what's there and about to happen on the ground, but to have a new administration coming in that can build on the comprehensive review that was done of the Vineyard Wind One project and move things forward rapidly get these new lease auctions and then meet not only their climate goals, but all again, the state targets and the state goals that are out there. It's going to be a very busy 2021. Yeah, absolutely. It brings a lot of hope and a lot of excitement for the next year, which I yeah. think is great. Well, Laura, Rachel, thank you so much for our discussion today during the moderated session. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot. I know I always gain new insights when we chat. So uh, now I think we'll turn it over and take some questions from the audience. And so we will just give Laura and Rachel a second to join us. There are lots of great questions coming in uh, through the chat window. So please continue to uh, put questions in there, and we only have a few minutes to answer them, so uh, we will do the best that we can to get through lots of them. Uh, maybe just as a starting question, Rachel, I know that there's been some changes uh, in the Vineyard Project since uh, we recorded our session previously, so maybe you could just give everybody an update as to what's gone on in the last couple of weeks. Sure, happy to, um, and great to see everyone again. So, yeah, so I mentioned uh, in the pre-recording that we had uh, taken some time out on the permitting process to do a final review of our selection of the GE wind turbine, and uh, we actually did complete that review. Um, and what we, uh, what the conclusion of that review was that we were not going to make any changes to our construction and operations plan, which is the permit application, the primary permit application. Um, 
And so we basically let the uh, lead federal agency know that, uh, that there were going to be no changes. And we, um, so we are expecting uh, that they can finalize their review based on the last uh, three years of analysis that they've been doing on this project and years before that of the general area. Um, and so we're, we're really excited. We think that there's a, a good strong amount of information and analysis for them to go off of, and uh, they should be able to, to complete this process um, uh, timely. Great, thanks for the update. So there's been a few questions about supply chain. I'm wondering if you both can talk a little bit about supply chain, both thinking about the East Coast and the vineyard project in particular, but also do you feel like we're building out the supply chain fast enough to support projects uh, as we look towards the West Coast as well? So I'm happy to start out on that. Um, I would say there's no question that we are um, building out our supply chain um, now, whether it's fast enough, um, excellent question. I mean, we do need that regulatory certainty um, that we all talk about with the permitting process um, to drive global investment here and to actually build that supply chain out. Um, you know, I did want to mention, you know, even just sort of the story uh, that it will be abbreviated, but um, you know, just building up the onshore supply chain took a little bit of time, but it is has really exploded. There are a huge number of components already in the US um, that are being manufactured that can be used for offshore. Uh, in terms of supply chain on the East Coast, um, one interesting story, and I can turn it to Rachel for a little bit further, further north, but there is a South Carolina company, Nexons, which is uh, developing, building high voltage subsea cables for a project. Um, and I believe the Gulf was mentioned briefly. I know we've talked about the Gulf, but these ships that are being built, um, wind turbine installation vessels uh, in uh, the sort of the Louisiana for service operation and then the WTIVs uh, in Texas. So, you know, we sort of have this up and down the coast um, building, but Rachel, maybe I could turn it to you for anything you may have um, closer to your project um, in the Northeast. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the short answer, the short answer, of course, is, um, you know, we can definitely do more. Um, so to answer the question, but I think there's been a lot of planning and a lot of effort. So I have a, you know, I have a sense that once the regulatory piece moves, there's a lot of companies positioned, they've been looking, they've been working with the governments, it's a huge incentive for each of the states um, to be pushing these. So it, it's going sort of hand in hand with the procurements. So we are seeing a lot of that. You're seeing some of the cables. We're not seeing all tier one. We're looking at tier two, tier three, um, and all of the opportunities. And um, no, I would just echo that the Gulf was, has a lot of opportunities for us as well, um, uh, especially with the marine transport options. So um, yeah. And, and maybe just to build on this, uh, you know, when we think of supply chain, we often think of components and vessels and equipment to be installed. Um, but, you know, there's also the, the supply chain needed where we need skilled workers and skilled laborers. And I know you both are working uh, in a big way to help train uh, local people and uh, get the communities more involved in your project, uh, in particular, uh, Rachel. But also I know that ACP is quite involved too in sort of some broader policies and, and being a bridge builder. I'd wonder if you both could just talk about that a little bit. Sure, um, Rachel, why don't you start off? I can take a quick start at it. We have um, a number of local programs that have come out of the, the, the first projects, actually more than just one project, uh, where we actually have classes ongoing already. Um, some of the unions are gearing up with their training facilities. Um, it's also the safety training facilities are, are building up, and we're also looking at some programs where we might be able to engage, um, we're actually engaged with programs that would engage other folks, other stakeholders that we engage with on the project. So uh, fishing communities and tribal communities, and what are some other communities that we can get involved in the workforce? I think, you know, you see um, this, you know, the exciting thing is we sort of have, the world is our oyster in the sense of like, if we're starting from scratch, we can really make a good effort to, to bring in the local communities. And I, I think I mentioned in the pre-record about, you know, some of the coastal communities that, you know, they had previously, you know, we work a lot of the city of New Bedford, right, which was like the whaling capital of the world and some of the other industries that were there that are no longer there. And so this is a huge opportunity to kind of rebuild that, um, that base of 
that workforce base um, that's located sort of outside of the city um, where we're seeing a lot of the, the workforce concentrate these days. Yeah, and to uh, to build on what Rachel said, as you said, uh, that ACP is um, very interested in workforce development. We talked about local content, but of course the local jobs. Um, Rachel mentioned, um, again, New Bedford, but there are maritime academies. Uh, the states are heavily in investing in workforce development. Um, Rhode Island is one that just comes to mind because we have a uh, Governor Raimondo from Rhode Island has just been nominated as Commerce Secretary. So that's just something that came to my mind initially with their huge workforce development um, initiatives. Yeah, I think it's such an important topic and we have a global audience here today, but you know, workforce development, safety, worker training, uh, you know, spurring the local economy, these are all things that I think have global applicability. So uh, happy that you guys could share some information on that today. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, as I tend to interrupt, as I think of something new, um, I just wanted to point out again, as I mentioned in the pre-record, how important it is for jobs for when we talk about coastal communities, many of the low income communities or otherwise disadvantaged um, communities uh, that are on the coasts and the environmental justice initiatives that have been really key um, companies coming in uh, focused on building up those uh, that port infrastructure. Um, and of course, this new administration uh, where environmental um, justice is a very, very important part of what they're looking at going forward. And I actually, I do have one other thought while we're, uh, so stick with this topic for one other moment. But um, I think, you know, most of the companies and a lot of the developers either are international or have an international pre uh, presence at this point in the U.S. And I think, you know, there's a, um, there is a, there's a natural tension of like, you know, to bring some of that knowledge and workforce over and rely on the teams and, and folks that you know really well and you've been working with and projects um, in Europe, and I, so I think it's really important for companies to have plans to transition that knowledge power um, and really concrete ones where they're that's showing in the community. It's really important that the community be able to see this happening. So you know, even early on, every stage of the project, whether it be you know the RFP stage or the development stage, that if there are people that are working from overseas, that they're they're partnered with people that are local, so they can you know, so we can be building that as quick as possible. Yeah, that's a really great point, Rachel. Uh, moving on to another question, somewhat uh, related, I think, is uh, the question about um, competing ocean uses or balancing different users. So based on your experience so far from uh, what we've seen in North America, what are the biggest barriers to balancing these different ocean users, uh, maybe the space claims, et cetera? Uh, you know, there are multiple users uh, in, in your project areas. Um, so just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you balance that and, and how you make room for multiple uses at your facility. So I could start with more of just the broader picture um, and then let Rachel drill down since she's uh, her project really is underway on the ground. Um, and again, since she's been in the industry uh, for a very long time um, addressing these issues. But I think the um, one of the most important points for us is that the offshore industry is absolutely committed to coexistence. Um, to partnering with, again, we said local communities, partnering with other ocean users, maritime industries, the federal agencies, that's what they do in terms of putting projects in right um, in the right way. They start off with very big lease areas, um, or actually the call, the very big call areas at first, and then they winnow it down to lease areas that have eliminated many of the um, the concerns about multiple use, and then do environmental review. That again takes all of these um, issues into account. Um, so I think you know Rachel can ask specifically probably as to vineyard, which may be. Um, analogous to others. Um, but again, I think my most important point is that, you know, the industry isn't seeking to take over the ocean. The industry is seeking to coexist because without those other users, we will never have successful projects. Yeah, I think that, that Laura's, um, Laura's got some strong points there and I agree with all of them. And I, I guess I just the sort of on the ground experience. Um, and I think I'm going to count the, uh, 
the North Atlantic right well as a user of that area because it does get a significant amount of attention for us. It's a species that is um, low in pop very low in population and has a um, significant amount of the conservation community has been working for a very long time uh, to bring that population back up. So, you know, there are cases in which um, the sort of other parties that we deal with um, when we're out there are a, a good consolidated group and we can kind of have really detailed conversations and we kind of see that and that some of the benefits are that we've been, you know, while we have been slow to build, we've been working on this and talking about it for a long time. So in some cases, the conversation is very evolved and the thoughts about what we can do. We're obviously, in the case of, of all of these issues, we're keeping pace with science, which will come in, you know, and we're continuing to get new information as we, you know, monitor the areas. So we, we evolved that piece um, through, in our case, very detailed conversations um, about how we use these areas. I mean, these are, there's just no, we don't find that blunt tools apply very easily to this because you know, these are big logistics projects and competing interests of what we have to accommodate. Um, and then, you know, on the fishery side of things, um, I think those conversations are still very difficult. I think they're, you know, they're continuing to be um, challenging for all of us including the fishermen. I think we're all like, a you know, a little frustrated with it. And I think on, on the fishery side, I note that, you know, we, uh, it is a, it's a broad group. Um, it doesn't, you know, at the moment have one consolidated representative that, or, you know, just a few. And I think that's a challenge that we face in terms of how do we make progress? How do we come to decisions that address the majority um, of concerns? Obviously there are third parties associated with this. So when it comes to questions of navigation, you know, we can lean on agencies like the U.S. Coast Guard that can help us, you know, make some good decisions there and balance um, the area. And I think, you know, there's also a lot of, I think I mentioned in the pre-record, it's the unknown, you know, so there's sort of critical nature of like building a project, studying a project. And um, I will I will say that, you know, I, I don't, I've been trying for a long time to kind of translate the sort of experience in Europe to the U.S. And I feel like it's really not going to take a total foothold until people see it for themselves and experience it for themselves. And we can kind of differentiate what are the real challenges versus, you know, what are concerns that don't come to fruition um, and what sort of risk can we retire? So I think, you know, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, we did, I mean, we have seen, you know, pushback on project layouts, distance between turbines. Those are some of the, the things that we've, you know, we've had really hard conversations about. And I think this audience will appreciate that, you know, these are, these are difficult accommodations for, offshore projects and, you know, they're important asks for users. So, you know, we're just working through them piece by piece and it's, it's, it's hard, um, but we're all committed to it. And as Laura said, um, you know, it's important. Yeah, absolutely. So we have about one more minute until we bring our DNVGL experts on. Maybe just quickly, I'll sneak in a question about technology uh, because there's been lots of talk about hydrogen and storage at, the, at this conference um, today and yesterday and tomorrow. So just wondering, are you contemplating storage? Is hydrogen even on your radar? I can just say for me, hydrogen is, is a little bit in the periphery, um, but the storage piece comes up quite a bit with the RFPs, and we've seen a number of different solutions to it from large uh, installations of storage options to, you know, pumped hydro. And um, in the case of the Vineyard Wind One project, we focus primarily on boosting existing projects. So people are trying to do storage projects with um, all around the area. And of course, we're a coastal community, so we're thinking a lot about resiliency and the various communities want to have um, energy sources and, you know, they want to have backup to their energy sources. So they've all got projects underway and we didn't really want to reinvent the wheel. So we're actually, you know, our plan in the first project, at least, is to kind of just is to push those along and get those done. Um, but there's a million different ways in which we're intersecting with it. Awesome. Great. Well, Rachel, Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to engage in this discussion, answer our questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, unfortunately. Uh, we are going to bring on now our DNV GL experts so we can answer some of those. But um, in the meantime, we'll say goodbye to Rachel and Laura and thank you one more time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you Have very much. Our pleasure. Bye. Yeah.
Thanks. So now uh, let's bring on some of our DNV GL experts. We have four wonderful uh, people who will be joining us. We can take more questions. So uh, we will bring on Kim Peters, who is uh, one of our offshore avian experts. We will bring on Noe Ruel, who is one of our floating experts at DNVGL. Uh, Sarah Aftergood has joined us. She is a regulatory and permitting expert uh, here in North America, but also has some great experience from Europe. So we can ask her some of these comparative questions. And then finally, Cheryl Stahl, who is our navigation and safety risk expert, will be joining us. So it looks like everyone is joining. Thank you very much. Uh, please feel free to add some more questions into the chat box, uh, everyone. But maybe we will just do a little bit of a, a round robin. There was a question in here uh, about the complexity of permitting involving different states and federal agencies. And if anyone could speak to how that might be different in North America versus a global offshore wind project. Um, I can certainly, Ellen, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, I can, I can start that off. Um, yeah, I mean, in North America, we're definitely in a growth pattern. Uh, in Europe, it's easy to look at it right now as countries have had a lot of time to develop the offshore wind industry. Uh, so it definitely didn't start off as, you know, one global permit for these projects. They had to work with the different government agencies and get different departments to figure out jurisdiction, who had jurisdiction over what resource and uh, what length out to sea. So you can see in countries like France, where now they have separate offshore wind departments dedicated to that work to give them the permits they need to build. And so that's just taken time and learning and intergovernment coordination. So here in North America and the US specifically, you know, you still have state jurisdictions, you still have federal jurisdictions, uh, you have county jurisdictions once you head on shore. So everyone is being still very respectful of what everyone's mandate is in those areas. I don't know if the future, what the future holds for that regulatory framework in the US, um, if, if we'll move towards a more federal heavy permit process. But I think for now, the states are really leaning into helping the federal government and the developers navigate the permitting. You're seeing states like New York really get involved, create permitting matrices and roadmaps to help developers understand what they need to get. Um, the nice thing is that what survey work or un environmental work that the developers do federally offshore can be used for the state permits. So there isn't like a doubling up of work happening. It's just, you know, you do have to write another permit, but everyone is trying to work together to understand uh, when the state process starts and when the federal process starts. And so um, I don't know, I don't know how this will mature and change in the coming future, but certainly the states that are really interested in their renewable energy goals are taking it seriously and really trying to uh, make it easy, as easy as possible for now. Great. Uh, any any other inputs to that? Um, Kim, Cheryl, in a way? I would just add that um, I agree that the states who are most involved um, have been really active in helping collect sort of baseline data over the last decade plus. And so the reason that we're able to move forward so smooth, well, smoothly and efficiently is because we have these data sets and they've really been driven by the states. New York is one that comes to mind, Rhode Island and Massachusetts as well. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes me think, Cheryl, of some of the work that you do with the Coast Guard and, uh, you know, data sharing, data collection. I don't know if you have any reflections on that that you want to share. Oh, and you're on mute still. Apologies. Um, it, exactly. The, the data of ships transmitting where they are has recently become more public. Um, which is a, a good step. Um, and as Kim and Sarah mentioned, some of the data sets for where fishing activity occurs are being updated and more data is coming available, which is extremely helpful. One key difference I see between the US 
and say North Sea or some of the European waters where offshore wind farms are being developed is here, there are some unique fishing gears that are not used in those waters. Um, and there are different, say, maritime risk controls put in place here rather than there, right? So we do have some different situations with, which then mean we have to use a different analyses to figure out what could be a best balance between the marine uses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually that makes me think, no way, given all of your experience working on floating structures in Europe, uh, I wonder, uh, is there anything in particular you feel like you know, you, the, the North American market should absolutely know or start considering? No, I think for the permitting process, uh, having floating structures Having, having floating structures, I don't think it makes a um, very big difference in, in terms of permitting, but what, uh, but what will matter in the US is that when the first wind farms will be installed, I think it will indeed bring a lot of confidence in the different stakeholders and uh, local communities. Uh, and there will be much less uh, opposition also from the fishing communities. As we saw in Europe, uh, it's always very difficult for the first wind farms. As it has been now in France, it's been like maybe six years of permitting and uh, for the first wind farm. But now that it's built, uh, I think everything uh, is going to be much easier. And that was the case for the other countries also, which started much before. Mm -hmm. So I think it's yeah. going to be easier and easier. So it goes, the first movers always have the, the heaviest burden. Uh, and you heard Rachel talk a little bit about that. So great. Uh, let's let's move on to a question about uh, operation and maintenance. The question is, how do future O and M requirements impact project economics? I think for this group, when you think about O and M requirements, a lot of times it has to do with compliance, right? Environmental compliance, compliance with your EIS or your COP or any sort of stakeholder commitments that you've made. Uh, can you all talk a little bit about what you're seeing as we're embarking on this work? There's not a whole lot of operational projects yet in North American waters, but um, you know, as we're helping entities develop and plan for their O&M requirements, uh, I'm wondering if you could share some insights. So from a permitting perspective on this, um, the permits that developers have to submit to the federal government have a project design envelope included in the engineering design. So what that means is developers are submitting a very wide range of what they could possibly be using. And it's to account for that, Ellen. It's to account for technology that they may want to use down the future, or technology that hasn't been developed yet. Um, so it's to think about the future and not get tied into what we have today. And that's actually taken from the European model of permitting offshore wind farms. Uh, so, you know, trying to predict as, as best as you can. Um, but like with anything, as we go down the road and new technology becomes available to us and creates more efficiencies and more cost effectiveness, it, it is always possible to work with government agencies to amend or resubmit permits, uh, especially if the footprint is less, the impacts are less, um, so I think that right now developers are costing it out and building what they, they think is the best possible option. Uh, but with anything that will get revisited in the future and amended, especially if it makes the project more efficient and, and better for the community. Yep, that's great. Go ahead, Kim. I was going to say, in terms of wildlife, so when we think about operational costs for things like terrestrial wind farms, um, the main cost and the main concern for operators is curtailment uh, requirements. And we haven't seen that um, coming into light as a, as a big mitigation option or, or requirement for offshore because really there are so many unknowns right now. Um, and the idea is for these projects as they move forward to help answer some of those questions. And that's what the agencies are looking for is more of a partner than uh, putting these really expensive restrictions on them. So uh, asking them to be involved in different kinds of net, uh, like monitoring networks and understanding before and after impacts of its attraction or displacement or understanding collision risk, those sorts of things. So um, there, those are things that have more certainty 
associated with them in terms of cost because you know what your role is going to be in terms of um, your being a research partner. And I think I think that's a, a good uh, way of sort of moving forward. Yeah. yeah. And concerning marine vessels and O and M activity, um, I think it remains to be seen whether each developer has their own philosophy, their own equipment, or if because many of these areas are near each other or even adjacent, um, whether they're able to find significant cost savings by uh, using common vessels or common facilities um, and sort of combining their philosophies to reduce the O&M cost. Yeah, no way. What about from a technology perspective? Uh, I know that we're talking a lot about permitting and development activities, but from a technology perspective, do you have any insights to share about reducing O&M costs? Uh, or maybe just from a general technical operations perspective, since that yeah, you have I mean, some background in that. Yeah, I mean, what we have seen so far in Europe is that actually uh, Maybe 99% of the O&M uh, operations are, are very light and uh, involving only CTVs and uh, personnel transport uh, vessels. So even if the even if uh, in the COP the developer try to plan for like the worst case scenario with uh, change out of major components involving uh, jackup vessel and everything, that's actually something very rare and. I mean, it's important to remember that the O&M is actually a very light operation uh, involving involving mostly very light vessels. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of technology, especially for, uh, again, the change out of major components in the turbine, which is the most costly and one of the biggest risks, we have seen some some uh, trends developing for, uh, for instance, uh, saying, uh, self-elevating uh, systems to, to uh, change a blade, for instance, or to change a hub without uh, the use of a uh, jack-up heavy lift vessel. So that kind of technology, I think, will continue to, to uh, develop and uh, it will really bring down the cost of, uh, of one m Great. Good, really good insights on that. Um, there are, I do want to let the audience know, there are a number of questions in here about offshore measurements and wake effects and dealing with different hub heights. Uh, we're, we're not, this is not the right audience to talk about wind resource. Uh, so unfortunately, we won't be answering those questions. Uh, and we are getting near the end of time. So maybe just one final reflection on the U.S. market and, and where you see it going over the next couple of years. What's your expert view on that? Are we going to move? Are we going to see more projects in California? Are we going to see more floating? Are we going to see um, more automated surveys? Look into that crystal ball like I asked Rachel and Laura to do and, and tell me what you see for the future here in this market. Let's start with Sarah since we've started with Sarah every time. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, yeah, I think floating. Is definitely gonna is definitely gonna pick up, especially because it can go closer to shore. Uh, so even though the floating turbine technology is more expensive, uh, the leased areas currently offshore are very expensive. So I think from a cost perspective, it could start equaling out if there's more inshore lease areas. Um, we've definitely seen more states call BOEM to create task force. I know Louisiana is a state that called for a task force a few months ago. So I don't know. I think the Gulf of Mexico is still to be seen on what's going to happen down there. There's a lot of interesting discussion. I live here in Houston, Texas, so it, it's always being talked about. But then, of course, you have the ERCOT Texas market where there's tons in West Texas, so we don't need offshore, but then companies are still dipping their toe in. So I'm, I'm curious to see what happens down here. Um, with that, I think California and Oregon are definitely next in terms of call areas, and they're all gearing up for floating technology. And then there's Maine. Maine wants floating turbines. They're more interested in that than fixed. Um, but I mean, New York, New Jersey is, so I think we're gonna see, once we get through this bottleneck of these first few wind farms and government agencies on a federal level get really comfortable with the impacts and communities start understanding what the real impacts are, 
I think that we'll start seeing more of a free flow of the market because now it's not so unknown and now we have American specific impacts to look at and we understand what's happening locally and everyone's I think just going to get more comfortable with the financing and understanding what to do and governments will just become more sophisticated in their permitting and how they want to handle it and give more direction to developers and I just think that it will all in time but I think those states the west coast for sure and I think the Gulf of Mexico, maybe, but I'm not too sure exactly floating fixed. I don't know in what state specifically, but I think the Gulf is one to keep an eye on. Mm, and maybe uh, potentially a place to keep an eye on for hydrogen as we're starting to think about storing energy. You mentioned the air car market, you know, the load in the state of Texas and surrounding areas is pretty well addressed by some of those highly uh, productive onshore wind farms in West Texas, uh, but maybe ripe for hydrogen storage or other types of storage in that market. Yeah, really interesting points there. Noe, do you want to jump in since Sarah talked so much about floating and, and you have a background? Do you agree with her? Do you disagree with her? Uh, what do you think? Oh, and you're on mute. No, it should be better. No, I agree with Sarah. In uh, states like uh, Maine or California, and in all the West Coast, actually, floating will be the only uh, the only way forward for offshore wind uh, because of the water depth, uh, which is like way above uh, 50, 60 meters, which is more or less the limit where uh, fixed bottom is uh, is doable. So yeah, the West Coast and Maine uh, will definitely go for uh, floating. For the Gulf of Mexico. There is a lot of space for fixed bottom. Um, the water depth is uh, is really appropriate for a fixed bottom. Uh, there is very large area. There are very large area around 40 meters depth, uh, which would which could be interesting for a fixed bottom. Uh, then a bit more offshore. I don't know. Maybe uh, yeah, floating if we go further offshore. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Kim, Cheryl, what do your crystal balls tell you? What are you thinking about when you think about the future of offshore wind development? Well, I'm, um, I agree that floating is likely to come, but I'm a little more pessimistic about the time frame. although no one really jumped in about a time frame. but I would, my, just my guess, right, is 10 years or more before we get anything really commercial out there for floating. Um, it probably won't be the East Coast, right? And uh, California will almost be like starting a new regulatory process. The first out will have a long, long road to hoe. Um, and, and Texas does have storage capability for hydrogen. It has pipeline access. And folks are already looking into what, what would it take to convert some facilities to uh, some of the transport facilities to hydrogen. So um, I think that might rival the timing of California floating for sure. Yeah. yeah, and especially in California, we see that there might be quite a lot of issues with the transmission of the power mm -hmm. um, because of the grid development and uh, hydrogen might be an answer. To do this. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I know that there are lots of market studies. There's lots of consideration on transmission in California and how to make that work. I haven't yet seen a whole lot of studies on on if hydrogen or storage solves that problem, but uh, I'm sure that those are coming very soon. Uh, yeah. And there are a lot of utilities in the state of California that are quite interested in storage solutions. So it's a really good point in a way. Kim, what do you think? We haven't yet talked about your your future predictions. Well, since, since we are talking about storage, I think it opens up just a vast opportunity for research because it's it's almost a black box in understanding what the interactions are going to be with wildlife risk and floating wind. Um, you know, more has been done on the European side, but there's still so much less known than with other types uh, of wind turbines. So understanding how uh, different types of anchoring systems are, are affecting 
using the environment uh, catenary versus taut lines, how they interact with, with fishing gear and how they, they may uh, affect the risk of entanglement. Uh, so there's so much to be learned. Um, and just one more thing outside of the, the whole idea of floating wind is just there's just so much technology um, emerging right now when it comes to monitoring for wildlife life risks and the Department of Energy is funding uh, many of the, the research projects around these to understand how uh, visual monitoring and infrared and radar and various kinds of passive acoustic monitoring and uh, uh, radio tagging animal networks. And there's so much going on impact detection systems. So I think you're gonna see a lot of movement in that area over the next five years. Yeah, really, really interesting mm -hmm. stuff, really exciting. And I feel mm -hmm. like you have so much of your finger on the pulse mm -hmm. of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to remind everyone, we probably have a little bit more time to take some more questions. We're getting through the majority of the ones that this group can answer. Uh, so by all means, if there are more questions out there for our experts, even if it is for one or two of the particular experts, please go ahead and put them in the uh, question chat window. Uh, there was a question in here that um, somebody had asked for a, just a comparative analysis about the complexity of permitting projects in different places. So we've talked about the East Coast, we've talked about the Gulf of Mexico, and we've talked about California. Any thoughts on, you know, in your particular subject matter areas, any thoughts on complexity? Where is easier? What are the issues? I don't know if any place is particularly easier, but certainly different issues in California to be aware of than, say, on the East Coast and, and certainly than in the Gulf of Mexico. Any Anything come to light? Well, uh, go ahead. So. No, no, go for it. <laughs> I don't know, uh, just you mentioned California. I think one of the specific thing in California uh, are the, mili uh, the military uh, operations. Um, mm -hmm. and the DOD ha have actually uh, reserves quite a big space for military operations. Um, and that will definitely be uh, one of the major stakeholders, I think, for permitting in California. And for, yeah, and maybe for the Gulf of Mexico, what is a bit specific uh, is uh, all the uh, oil and gas uh, installations and infrastructures, lots of pipeline on the seabed. Uh, that will be, I think, something quite specific to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Absolutely. And a lot of that pipeline infrastructure information is not publicly available, understandably. And so it creates quite a challenge. Same with, with related information about military training routes, where military buoys are installed, et cetera. So lots and lots of stakeholder coordination uh, to make sure we really understand where that infrastructure lies or where there are potential no-go zones. It's a great point. Sarah, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think there's ever going to be an easy place to build these projects because every every state is going to have its own unique um, aspect that it values and it's going to be the issue that they care about. And so, you know, we're seeing the Northeast that there's huge community involvement for commercial fishermen uh, because those communities are really important to those states and their resources very valued. And so it's just, I don't know if there's ever going to be a quote unquote easy permitting, but it's always going to be developers are just going to have to always be flexible and strategic and work with communities to understand what's important to them and work with the local government agencies to figure out what's important to them because it's just going to change everywhere you go. And every time you build a project in the U.S., every state has their own idea of what's important to them. So it's important to just be uh, malleable to that and, can't, and sort of move in the direction of where the community goes. And that's how you'll build community trust. And that's how you'll build good relationships. And then that's how you'll build projects. Um, so, you know, you can't assume that what New Jersey cares about is what New York cares about, even though they're neighbors. You know, you can't go in with that mentality. So I think it's just going to be what states will be able to create a permitting process that developers can use to build projects and and where we can have permits 
formed that allow projects to get built. And that's where, like, that's where this should go. Yep, very good. Kim, what do you think? From a wildlife perspective, talk us through. There's different species. Yeah. <laughs> um. well, yeah, I mean, it just like Sarah said, there's different priorities and there's different people in the room. So it really depends on getting to know who the people are, who those stakeholders are, what's important to them, even at a wildlife um, perspective, because, you know, there it, there's this sort of standard, okay, these are the species that are listed and these are the species that are of concern, but you don't know, you know, how those are prioritized then within those groups, or even, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on some species that are, are not uh, federally or state listed because we've learned that they are important to certain NGOs um, or conservation organizations. So um, I just think, yeah, it's important to get in there early. Areas that have better baseline data are always going to be better to work in because if you catch these areas on their heels and all of a sudden they say, oh no, you're building in two years and we don't know what's there. Um, so to get in early and work with them to try and answer those questions early is really important. Uh -huh. Yep, that's a great point. Cheryl, what do you think from a, a navigation and Coast Guard perspective? Yeah, from navigation risk, um, I can see the Gulf being a little more straightforward just because there are already structures in the water, that that's something that the regulators are used to having to deal with and permit. Um, whereas in California, there's a very little experience with that. Um, and then the Northeast, of course, they're working through it at the moment. So. Um, you know, there, there are solutions, but they take some time to come to it. So on that basis, I would say maybe Texas and Louisiana might have a shorter permitting process from a marine risk perspective. Great. All right. Well, I think we have managed to get through all of the questions from the audience. We've answered a few additional questions that I've thrown out at you. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank Rachel and Laura again for giving us such a wonderful presentation and being so open with their information. And of course, thanks to all of our experts here. Uh, participants, you can reach them through the platform. You should be able to find and connect with people. So if you have additional questions for Sarah, Kim, Noe, and Cheryl, by all means, please reach out to them and by all means, you can reach out to me. And uh, I think next up is the recap session by Ditlev Engel. I would also encourage you to check out some of the virtual booths and thank you all for participating. We hope you uh, got a lot out of this. Thank you. Bye Thanks. guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen.